This is Monday, July 22nd, a hot evening in Austin, Texas. This is Bringing Light into Darkness. All right, welcome. This is 91.7 KOP Hornsby, Austin. This is Bringing Light into Darkness. And this is your host, Pedro Gatos, along with my host, Bob Daly. Bob, thanks for being here tonight. De nada. We want to welcome all of our listeners, and this is Bringing Light into Darkness. And it just unfortunately seems we're slipping into more and more darkness as, as time passes on with respect to so many unattended issues, climate change and the wars that are ravaging the world around us and everything else that's going on. So we, we take advantage of a great privilege of having a show here to try to drill down and take a little bit of a look at what's going on. We, we feel that if people are well informed, that action-oriented activities to reverse the trend become more probable. We are really blessed tonight to have a very special guest that I'm going to introduce in just a second more formally, but I just wanted to indicate to our listeners that we're going to have the esteemed journalist Patrick Lawrence joining us in just a second after the news break here. But I just wanted to start off the show with a short news segment because I want to spend the volume of our time with our guest. Back in May, there was a press conference that Robert Mueller, he's the special counsel, he announced that his report was was done, and he described as essential allegation of this two-year Russia probe that the Russian government engaged in, quote, multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election, and that allegation deserves the attention of every American, and it certainly does. We've had indictments, two major indictments during his tenure, and the evidence to support the indictments has not been made as public as we hope. We have coming up, just in a couple of days, Mueller will be testifying on the 24th on Wednesday after delaying it one week. But Mueller's comments echoed this concern that deserved every American's attention. The 2017 Intelligence Community Assessment, the ICA, that asserted with high confidence that Russia had conducted sweeping 2016 election influence campaign. The quote was, I don't think we've ever encountered a more aggressive or direct campaign to interfere in our election process. That was the quote of then Director of National Intelligence James Clapper at a Senate hearing. I bring that up because they are very similar, I I think, the ICA assessment and the Mueller report so far as we understand it. And I had the pleasure of having Jack Matlock on this show. He's a former ambassador to Russia during the Reagan administration, a conservative, a very distinguished diplomat. And he shared information about the ICA that he found very disturbing. Uh, He said, I spent the 35 years of my government service with top secret clearance When I reached the rank of ambassador and also worked as special assistant to the president for national security, I also had clearances for code word material. At that time, the intelligence reports to the president relating to Soviet and European affairs were routed through me for comment. I developed at that time a feel for the strengths and weaknesses of the various American intelligence agencies. It is with that background that I read the the January 6, 2017 report of three intelligence agencies, the CIA, the FBI, and the NSA. This report, if you remember, was labeled the Intelligence Community Assessment, but in fact, he said it is not that. A report of the intelligence community in my day would include the input of all the relevant intelligence agencies and would reveal whether all agreed with the conclusions. Individual agencies did not hesitate to take a footnote or explain their position if they disagreed with a particular assessment A report would not claim to be that of the intelligence community if any relevant agency was omitted. He's writing these words and sharing those words with me, but the the written document is a June 29, 2018 piece that he posted called The Intelligence Community, Russian Interference, and Due Diligence. To go on, he says, the report states that it represents the findings of three intelligence agencies, the CIA, FBI, and NSA, but even that is misleading in that it implies that there was a consensus of relevant analysts in these three agencies. In fact, the report was prepared by a group of analysts from three agencies pre-selected by their directors with the selection process generally overseen by James Clapper, 
then director of the National Intelligence, the DNI. Clapper told the Senate in testimony on May 8, 2017, that it was pre- prepared by, quote, two dozen or so analysts, handpicked seasoned experts from each of the contributing agencies, end quote. And so Matlock made the distinction that if you can handpick the analysts, you can handpick the conclusions. The analysts selected would have understood what Director Clapper wanted since he made no secret of his positions. Anyhow, with that as kind of an introduction, today we have with us the distinguished writer and journalist Patrick Lawrence. He writes on foreign affairs commentary for a variety of publications. And before I formally introduce him, first, Patrick, welcome to Bringing Light into Darkness. Thanks. Very generous introduction, Pedro. Yeah, let me let me share with our audience that Patrick Lawrence, he, he was a correspondent abroad for many years, chiefly for the International Herald Tribune. His most recent book is Time No Longer, Americans After the American Century, was published by Yale University Press. He is on Twitter, at The Flautist. His website is patricklawrence.us. And on August 9th, 2017, I think was the first piece on or about August of 2017, that I read your writings, um, you had been interviewing several of the Veterans for Intelligence Professionals for Sanity. These are retired CIA and other national intelligence professionals. And The Nation published your piece in an article entitled, A New Report Raises Big Questions About Last Year's DNC Hack. I found your writing style very thorough, comprehensive, reasonable, and I think that's really what this show is about, or at least the attempt is to try to separate out fact from fiction to try to interpret what's become kind of a political football of sorts, this ongoing Russiagate story. A year ago, almost a year ago today, you wrote the Too Big to Fail Russiagate one year after the Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity showed a leak, not a hack. That was back in August 13th, 2018. There was a quote in that piece that I thought would be a good starting point for our discussion today, Patrick, and that was, American discourse has descended to a dangerous level of irrationality. The most ordinary standards of evidentiary procedure are foregone. Many of our key institutions, the foreign policy apparatus, the media, key intelligence, and law enforcement agencies, the political leadership, are now extravagantly committed to a narrative none appears able to control. The risk of self-inflicted damage these institutions assume should the truth of the Russiagate events emerge, as one day surely it will, is nearly incalculable. And this is what inspired your comparison to some of the McCarthyism whenever anyone demanded kind of proof of some of these Russian accusations that were being alleged and have been continued to be alleged, and we're still waiting for some clear proof. No one's for sure what's up or what's down, but what we do know is we have not gotten that that clear proof. But anyhow, with that being said, can you speak a little bit more to the universe of discourse that is, is so conflictive? Yeah, certainly, Pedro. My judgment for some time, uh, shared with others, is that uh, we have, uh, the, the word evidence has become somewhat of a, of a cursed word. One is uh, pinned to the wall just to, uh, by asking for evidence. You know, you don't have to have standards very much higher than a police blotter reporter to look at this uh, Russiagate mess and say, let's see the evidence, right? You mentioned the intelligence community assessment. It's completely fraudulent. Anyone who, I invite, it's not terribly long. I invite your listeners to read it for themselves, draw their own conclusions. Uh, It's absolutely Swiss cheese, as, as flimsy as it gets, right? And as you pointed out, very few people actually signed on, right? But the question of evidence has been the great big elephant in the room for a very long time for actually from the very beginning of this mess in in mid-july 2016 and my theory is as follows i think the democratic party apparatus with the media by its side the connivance or the collusion of um, the intelligence agencies and parts of the law enforcement uh, sphere, justice, FBI, 
they constructed, uh, I, I was watching it from the very first, uh, July 25th, uh, three years ago this week, okay? They constructed a story to paper over the revelations in the w first WikiLeaks uh, mail releases, which were, I mentioned to your listeners today, three years ago, that I think was meant to last six months, okay? Let me say, I think in terms of machinery and design tolerances, okay, uh, if you buy a Mercedes-Benz, it has a design tolerance of many years. Uh, it is meant to last. If you buy your son or daughter a toy, it's not really meant to last very long at all. It's going to wind up a pile of little screws and springs in the living room floor, right, in a matter of weeks. The Russiagate narrative was meant to last until November 8th. And when Hillary was elected, it was going to float away. No one would care anymore. Well, no one, November 8th came and went, and Hillary was not elected, of course. And I think uh, the, the, the aforementioned constituencies have been stuck with this Rube Goldberg contraption for three years. They've had to keep it going ever more wobbly in its character, right? And that's what we're watching now. We're watching those who created this narrative prolonging it way beyond its designed life. And still, after three years, right up through the Mueller report, the same question obtains. Where is the evidence? We have not had any. I'll leave my reply there. We just simply haven't had any. Mm -hmm. And again, you don't have to have an ideology or a or an agenda, or anything else. You just have to be a paying attention person, or as I said earlier, you know, a, a middling newspaper, re the standards of a middling newspaper reporter to say, okay, this is what you say happened, show. Right. Right. So, I'll desist there. Yeah. No. And when you you make that point in your writings, I think very well, which I which caught my attention, which was just speaking from the perspective of trying to get at the truth. You know, that's that's the nature of law is that, you know, you're, of course, innocent until proven guilty type of thing. And presenting that evidence is part of this process. And when you have this ongoing situation, I think what, what, what confuses people and gets people on their hind feet, especially the uh, more liberal elements of our culture, is that when you demand evidence, people mistakenly assume that you are claiming... Some kind Russia. of antagonist. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. And, that you're, and that you're claiming Russian innocence, which, which may or yeah. may not be the case. But no, you're actually just... These are huge issues of, of great concern that are pushing the, the world closer and closer to worse conflicts. Pedro, Pedro let, me, um, let me interject here and go back to your question of rationality and irrationality. I think we need to re look back at the 1950s and reflect. Maybe some of your listeners are old enough to recall that period. Maybe a few more have read enough to know what we're talking about. I was rather young, but not entirely unalert to what was going on around me, right? In later decades, that period takes on a, a, a kind of grotesque character. We look back upon it as if it's deep in the past, and that was then, and how, how could Americans get so strangely carried away irrationality was the OD, okay? Uh, the, the worst of it was wildly beyond any reason. And I think we need to reflect upon that and wonder what the historians of the future, I hope there are some good ones, uh, will have to say about us. I, I think it's rather quite closely similar. We Americans tend to get carried away with uh, things from time to time from the Salem witch trials onward, right? It just seems to be some peculiar element in the American character, right? Uh, and I think we're in the middle of one of those periods. And it's, it's rather difficult to swim against the current, but I think one must swim against the current. You know, uh, you, you can look at yourself properly in the mirror, you do your work, whatever it costs you to continue doing it honestly, you do it. Now, I think there's no there's no doubt that that's what our 
country was founded on was what was asking uh, questions, you know, right over wrong, investigating and trying to get at the truth of matters is something that I think has been abdicated so much by our, our media, but not by individuals that have faith in trying to do the right thing. Listen, we need to take a quick break. When I come back, I wanted to walk through with you and have you speak to the types of issues that you think would be most appropriate to be asking Mr. Mueller about in his report and uh, the things that have been claimed versus the things that have not had the evidentiary support made public. 